Thank you, man. Bless you so much. Wow. Bless you. Wow. Love you. <laughs> you may be seated. Thank you so much for that welcoming. I love it. I appreciate that. And may the good God continue to do you good. Uh, to the Apostle Nikki and together with Pastor Lillian, thank you so much for loving me and thank you for giving me this opportunity to come and minister to this beautiful, you know, people, the men and the women of God, and I uh, don't take this for granted. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, ma'am, for believing in me. I really appreciate this, you know. Every moment in my life, it is very, very special. I mean, for me to be here, um, it reminds me once again that it's a, it is a miracle. Uh, I was not even supposed to be standing here. I mean, my guys from our church, some of our pastors are here. Every time when I stand in front of people, the Spirit of God will continue to remind me to say this by the grace. Day one, when my parents were expecting me, they wanted to abort me. Age 10, ran away from home for five years. I was in the streets of Johannesburg, taking Dacha, taking glue and all that. For five years, I was taught how to read at the age of 15. I'm a living miracle. I'm a living miracle. And I'm so grateful for what the Lord is doing. I thought I needed to give that to somebody. You, you, you are a minister of the gospel and you're trying to put things together. You're asking yourself, how can I move forward? I want to tell you, if the Lord has done this, for a boy who was born in Tembisa, in a township, taught how to read, at the age of 15. Everything with God is possible. Look what the Lord has done today. So all glory to him. I continue to learn every day. You know, when I was here yesterday, once again, the Lord showed me that ministry can be done in a different way. You don't have to be somebody else. Just be yourself. And that is what this man of God and this woman of God said to me. Pastor Chris, we, we want you for who you are. You know, because sometimes you get tempted when you are among other speakers. You want to be somebody else. I appreciate, you know, Pastor Nikki, Apostle Nikki. I mean, Apostle Felix who was here yesterday, who prayed for the witch to die. <laughs> and I'm saying... <laughs> We are all gifted in different ways. <laughs> I can't be like him. I don't pray for them to die. I'm a shepherd. I pray for them, not save them. <laughs> but we are gifted in different ways. So this morning, I'll be ministering you, to you in a different way. Restoring God's presence conference. What a conference. What a prophetic what a prophetic conference. We need the presence of God like never before. Not money, not all those things, but the presence of God. Because just the bit of God's presence, things can be restored in a second. So, while I was preparing this sermon for this morning, I was at the same time privately pondering the following questions. This was my prayer and questions that I was thinking about while I was preparing this. Maybe you may need to write them down. Why are so many Christians so strong in faith, prayer, and fasting, but economically poor? I was just pondering on these questions. And another question that I was thinking about while I was preparing. Why Africa, with all its vast resources, is still classified as a dark continent? I was just thinking. 
Why do we have so much corruption in a country that has 75 to 80 percent of the population claiming to be Christians? I was just pondering while we are gathering here. With so much great leadership and excellence demonstrated in our churches every Sunday, why is there so much filthy and chaos on our streets and our communities? While there is so much excellence in the house of the Lord. I mean, you look at this excellence right here, but we don't see it on our streets and in our community. Even while I was driving here on the side of Tembisa, the grass has not been cut, papers all over. I was just pondering on these questions. With so much God's power we carry and demonstrate in our Sunday services, why are so many God's people suffer on Monday to Saturday under the hands of the evil employers and politicians. I was just asking myself, these people, they come every Sunday here. We empower them. But Monday to Saturday, they suffer in the hands of their employers and the politicians. Here is another question. With so much suffering, inflation, poverty, and unemployment among the young people, is the church really scratching where it itches? If things do not get better, what will happen with our children's future? What kind of the world will they live in or what kind of the world will they inherit? Is there hope for our country or is there hope for our continent? I may not have answers to these questions, but God does. But God does. I just thought we needed to think about these things. I have entitled my message this morning, Reclaiming Your Kingdom Identity. Reclaiming your kingdom identity. It is the fact that most, the most asked questions in the universe is these two questions. Who am I and what am I here for? These are the main questions that we ask ourselves as pastors. Who am I? What am I here for? A young person will ask himself, a woman will ask himself this question, pastors, leaders, they ask themselves this question. Our lives depend on how we answer these questions. These questions, listen to me, they affect everything from our career choices to the way we relate to God and others. If you can't answer this question, it's going to affect your ministry. It's going to affect your relationship. It's going to affect how you relate to God. You see, I struggled with this because I grew up without a father. And when I was supposed to address God as a father God, I had a problem with my biological father. And because that matter was not fixed, I struggle to address him as a father. If these questions are not answered, they will affect every area of your life. Unfortunately, most of us base our identity on what we have or what we do, such as our friends, such as our job titles, you know, our marital status, Sometimes you ask somebody, you said, how are you? What is your name? And they introduce themselves and also tell you their experience and say, I'm a divorcee. Is that your identity? Your experiences now, you have made them your identity. 
Sometimes the car we drive, you know, the houses we own, the clothes we wear, the likes and followers we have on the social media has become our identity. If we don't have more followers, it's like you are nobody. We, we are struggling with our identity. And my question this morning, if all these things can be taken away from you, who are you? If all these things can be taken away from you, who are you? We're talking about reclaiming your kingdom identity because that is what has been lost in the body of Christ. That is why we are struggling even with the presence of God. Sometimes the presence of God is right there, but because you don't understand who you are and what you possess, you cannot even identify when the presence of God is there or not there. Things to note about identity. I'm just giving you these things. I have not started preaching. I'm just putting my foundation here. Things to note about identity, please. I'm just giving you this for free. Number one, don't let your struggles and your past pain define who you are. Take it from me. Never allow your past pains and your past struggles to define who you are. That is why we have terrible leaders in this country. They can't lead in the future because they are still trapped in the past. As long as you are trapped in the past, you will never give anything for the future. That is the problem of this country. And I'm saying to you, never, don't allow your struggle and your past pain to define who you are. Number two, your identity impacts what you do, how you do it, and who you do it with. Very important. It, it will impact you. Sometimes you'll move from one job to the other. And you'll think it is people who has a problem. And the truth is, the English saying says, it says, wherever you go, there you are. The people are not the problem. I asked one man in our church who got married four times. And when you speak to them, he says, these women, he says, these women, they've messed me up. And then when I look at the whole matter, there is a one common denominator. <laughs> Number three, if you don't know your identity, you will constantly perform for people's approval because you don't know your identity. Remember, I'm just putting my foundation here. We are going somewhere. Number four, be the person God has made you to be, not the person you have allowed yourself to become. Not the person you have allowed probably your environment to shape you, your surrounding to shape you. Refuse that. Here is the most important one. If you don't know who you are, you might bargain for what you already have. If you don't know who you are, you might bargain for what you already have. It happened with Adam and Eve, created in God's image, male and female. He created them. Position in God's presence, the Garden of Eden. Blessed to be fruitful and to multiply. Assigned to take dominion and subdue the earth. Yet the devil whispered to her ears and said, you are not enough. That is what the devil said to Eve and said, you are not enough. You know why God doesn't want you to eat from this tree? It is because you will be like him in verse 3 of Genesis, in verse 5 of Genesis chapter 3. It says, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. And the last time I checked, they were already like God. 
They were already made in the image of God and the, in the likeness of God. But if you don't know who you are, you will bargain for what you already have. You will spend more money for what you already have. The Lord has given you these things, but because you don't know, you buy what you have. You bargain for what you have. We need to talk about these things. Let me just remind you. Of your identity because a lot of things has happened especially during COVID Apostle Nikki we have lost our identity even as ministers and I understand I mean the, the, the COVID has messed us big time because your house has become an office your house now has become a school you had to teach your children at, at, at home you had you had to be you had to work at, at home you had to have church at home so the, there was a loss of identity somewhere there. So you were no longer sure if you are a wife. It's time for you to be a wife. It's time for you to be a teacher. You know, we had a lot of struggles. That is why so many divorces, you know, even among the pastors, because there was a chaos. We lost our identity. There was a moment I wanted my wife to come with me in the bedroom, and she says, I'm still helping the kids with the, with the home, but I want you now, darling. I'm at work, my darling. And there was a chaos in the house because there was a confusion. Even when you jump into the bedroom, and then now she's still, you know, in the track suits. We lost the identity. So much chaos during COVID. But I'm here to remind you of your identity. Can I remind you of who you are this morning? Knowing your identity, number one. Listen to me. You are God's masterpiece. You. You are God's masterpiece. That is what the Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do great works that he has planned for us many years ago. That is the first identity about you. And then number two, you are God-like. You are God-like. That is what Genesis 1 verse 27 says. God created human beings. He created them God-like, reflecting God's nature. We carry the presence of God wherever we go. That is your assignment. That is who you are. And then number three, you know, you are blessed. That is what the scripture says. Then God blessed them and said to them, you know, be fruitful and multiply. You have been wired with blessings in the inside of you. You may not look blessed, but you are blessed according to the scripture. In the inside of you, there's a system of multiplication. Whatever you touch, it is bound to multiply. Because this is how you have been designed by God. It is bound to multiply. It is your design according to the heavens. So when we give to church, we don't give to get blessings. We give because we are blessed. When I give, I give because I'm blessed. So people, they don't understand that. This is who you are. Number four, you are seated with Christ. You are seated with Christ. Listen to what it says in the book of Ephesians. It says, even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. I am here physically, but in the spirit realm, I am in the position of authority. I am not just standing with him but I am seated with him, which is the sign, you know, of rulership, which is the sign of authority. I am here physical, but I'm seated with him. 
in the spiritual realm. I declare things with him. And when I declare things, they do happen. Oh my goodness. Can, 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 can I have my chair, my brother? Can, can I have that chair in the name? You know, we, we, we are seated with him. Listen to me, child of God, you might be struggling physically. Things may not happen physically, but you need to know that you are not just here physically. According to the scripture, you are seated with him. You are seated with him, you know, in the place of authority. That is what the scripture says. This is who you are. You are here. You are here. You are declaring things right here. The problem of the church is that we don't know who you are. The government, they don't even listen to us because we don't know. We have sold ourselves cheap because we don't know who we are. We are seated with Christ. That's what the scripture says. Here is another thing. I'm just telling you of your, of your, your identity. You are royalty. You are royalty. That is what the scripture says. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his special people, that you may proclaim, proclaim what? The praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. When we are seated with him, we proclaim things. We proclaim life. We speak things and things, they come into being. What is not possible with man becomes possible with him because it is not by might. It is not by power. It is about your position that you are carrying. You are seated with him. The church of Jesus, we have lost our identity. We're moving around begging, asking for mercies because we don't know who we are. Listen to me. You are not just royalty. You are fashioned or designed to rule. Not to be ruled, but to rule. Unfortunately, we have handed over those rights. And we took a back seat. We started hiding in the building, forsaking our responsibility. You are fashioned to rule. Listen to what it says in the book of Psalms. Chapter 8, the verse that we all know. It says, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. He says, you have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength. One translation says praise. It says, because of your enemies, he gave us strength because of his enemies. He did not just give the angels strength because of his enemies, but he ordained praise and strength and he gave it to us so that we can stand against his enemies. He says that you may silence the, the enemy and the avenger. And he goes on, the writer says, when I consider your heavens, my goodness me, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained. He goes on, he says, what is the man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him. For you have made him a little lower than the angels. But you know that the other translation, it says we are, you know, we're going to judge the angels one day. And you have crowned him. This is us. With glory and honor. That is our identity. He has crowned us with glory and honor. Listen to me, children of God. The issue of restoring the presence of God is not about speaking about the presence of God to be in the house of God only. And thereafter we leave, we leave the presence of God in the house of God. We have missed it. That is why when we come on Sunday, you know, the moment we approach the doors, you know, it's like now we're acting holy because we are stepping into the presence of God. And the moment we leave the house of God, we become little devils. You know, come Sunday again, and then we come in again, and then we begin to honor God. Failing to understand 
that God has crowned you with glory and honor. He has crowned you with his presence. He wants you to carry his presence wherever you go. When you go to work on Monday, you know, here comes the presence of God. When you go to your position on Monday, teacher at school, here comes the presence of God in a class. Businessman, here comes the presence of God in the business area. You are carrying the presence of God everywhere you go. It's not something that you lock into and you log off. This presence of God is not a computer. I'm logging into the presence of God. And now I'm logging off into the presence of God. You carry your presence even when you get into your bedroom. In the name of Jesus. Everywhere you go. You carry the presence of God. But listen to what verse 6 says. You don't carry the, the glory and the honor for nothing. He says you have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. Listen, he says you have put some things, some things, all things under what? Under my feet. All things under my feet. What is all things? It means all. The government of this world should be under my feet. The economy of this world should be under my feet. The agriculture of this world should be under my feet. The business of this world should be under my feet. The educational system of this world should be under my feet. The medical system of this world should be under our feet. All of these things should be under our feet. But you know what we have done, men of God? We took only the spiritual part. We said this is going to be under our feet. We even came up with songs. Say, silver and gold, I'll rather have Jesus than silver and gold. I don't sing that song. I don't sing that. Because I understand the scripture. I would rather have Jesus and silver and gold. Because I know the role and the responsibility of silver and gold. When you have silver and gold, listen to me. When you go to the bank, they ask you, how are you, say? But if you don't have silver and gold, they ask you, who are you? But when you have money, they say, how are you, say? Can we offer you a cup of coffee? But when you don't have money, they say, who are you? Because you have embraced only the spiritual matters. All these things should be under our feet. In the name of Jesus. We are breaking that spirit in the name of Jesus. Enough is enough. We have given the children of the devil to take charge of our country. Look at the mess that we are in today. Look at the wars that we are facing today. You know why these wars? It is because we have allowed the children of the devil, you know, to be the leaders. And all that they do, you know, is to destroy, is to bring destruction because their father, the devil, the Bible says he came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. They are just like their father. They destroy everything that they come across. What do you expect if, if the devil's children are in power? You praying for peace? Where? You praying for godly government? Where? Where? When the children of the devil, I'm putting it straight, I fear no evil. When the children of the devil are in power, you are praying for the peace of God. How do you pray for a demon to get saved? 
How do you pray for a demon to give you peace? Get rid of that thing. Jesus says, I have come. I have come. The devil came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The very same verse, he says, I have come so that they may have life and life in abundance and life overflowing. Oh my goodness me. Listen to me, listen to me. Apostle, when he says life overflowing, if I take a horse pipe, I connect it to the source, and I take a glass of water, and I begin to pour from the source, the glass will be filled. If I continue to pour, it will overflow. When it overflows, it will affect this flow. And then when I continue to pour, the water will continue to overflow. And then it will affect your flow. If I continue to pour, the water will continue to flow. It will go out through the doors. If I continue to pour, the water will go out of the gates into the community. If I continue to pour, the water will go out into other communities. Jesus says, I have come so that they may have life and life in abundance. Life in abundance. And if I have different comp compartments of life, it will overflow from my marriage into my finances into the life of my children, into the life of my children's children, into the life of the next generation. That is the life overflowing. Unfortunately, the body of Christ, we wanted to keep it to the church. No wonder the mess that we are in. Here is something. I'm still reminding you of who you are. I'm still reminding you. You are saved for posterity. You are saved for posterity. Leading a church, it's primary. But the main purpose is for posterity. Not just to be a pastor with a salary and paying the rates, water, and light. Do you think you are saved just to pay water and light? Even our prayer, if, oh God, I can have a building and be able to pay water and light. Do you think Jesus died on the cross so that where now you can pay water and the lights? This thing is bigger than water and light. It's for posterity. Joseph didn't understand. Or should I say his brothers didn't understand. Now he's in the position of authority in, in Genesis chapter 45. He reveals himself. And the brothers are so scared of him because he was in a position of power, of authority. They begin to apologize. But listen what he says in verse 7. He says, God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity. Where? In the earth. And to save your lives by a great deliverance. This young man, he said it was not about you selling me to slavery, to Egypt. He says, you were just a channel, but this was bigger than you. He says, this was not even about you. Now your lives are saved, but not just for you, but for the entire world. Joseph saved lives when he was in Egypt. He was not just a child of God. By the way, we still have to credit him especially the African people, you need to uh, uh, honor Dave, uh, Joseph for Bildong. 
because that was his idea. That was his idea. Seven years of plenty. He said, let's take this meat and let's produce some biltong. <laughs> Preserve the food so that it can last for another seven years of drought. He's the man who introduced tin stuff. He says, we can have cans, we can have tin stuff. He's the man who introduced refrigerators. He says, we need to preserve, we need to preserve because other people will come from other nations and the child of God who was anointed by God, he raised him for that season when the nation was in a serious chaos and God raised the Joseph. Allow me to declare this morning that God is going to raise Joseph in these ministries. God is going to raise Joseph in these ministries in the season of famine. May the church of Jesus rise. May the church of Jesus take their rightful position. Understand that your role is to become the Joseph and save the nation. We don't take a back seat during pandemic. You know, I'm not blowing my trumpet. I'm not blowing my trumpet. Just in the season of two years, we build over 20 houses for the destitute. Because we understood our role. We had money that we have put aside to build a building. And then, you know, up to 15 million, 15 to 20 million rand, we decided that, you know what, there are pastors who are struggling. We're going to supply the groceries for them so that we can preserve their lives. Yes, they might have lost their buildings, but if you can preserve the life of a man of God, they will come, they will get their building back because the buildings are in the inside of them. Preserve the life of the men of God and the women of God. We had to spend that money, making sure that we, we take care of, of God's servants in our township. I mean, the, almost the whole of Tembisa, every pastor was under our database. Togoza, every pastor was under our database. We provided food. We used that 20 million rand. We said, let's use it to the kingdom of God. If God has raised us to become the Joseph, He's going to supply. And guess what? Last year, we believe in God for a, Last year, in the middle of COVID, my guys are here. We got a building in Midrand. And guess who was the owner of the building? The Guptas. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, in Midrand. Number 55, Richards Road, if you have been there. You know, we got that building for 25 million rand. For 25 million rand, man of God, we got that building. And then when we went in just to go and insure the building, you know, the, the, the insurers, they said to us, we cannot insure this building for 25 million rand because if anything happens, we cannot, we cannot rebuild this building for 25 million rand. They said, this is our calculation. We have made our calculation. If anything goes wrong with this building, and then you, we're going to need 164 million rand, you know, to build this building. 164 million rand. God gave it to us. Just like that. Took it from Kuptas. <laughs> Isn't what the scripture says? The wealth of the wicked. The wealth of the wicked must be given to us. Listen to me, church of Jesus. When things are bad in a nation, don't run away. It is not time to run to England. It is not time to go to Canada. You know, look around. God will put things together. You know, for those who love him, it's for the benefit of the church. It's for our own benefit. Gather. We must gather for his kingdom. But remember, you are saved for posterity. We had to buy that building, not for myself, for the sake of the next generation. You see, we don't understand the issues of posterity. David understood that. When Goliath stood before the children of Israel, he said, give me a man. Give me a man to fight. And if this man conquers me, he says, 
myself and my people, we're going to serve you for the rest of our lives. But if I conquer that man, you and your children will serve us for the rest of your life. Now listen to me. That was not just a battle between David and Goliath. It was a generational battle. David understood that I am not just fighting my battle here. Behind me, there's a generation. Behind me, there are my children. Behind me, there are my grandchildren. If I lose this battle now, it is not me losing the battle, but it is me and my children and my grandchildren and my children's children, they're going to lose the battle. Watch the space. The Bible says, David ran. He ran into the battle, battlefield because he understood the agency of this matter. See, the church of Jesus, we don't understand the agency of this matter. No wonder we are dragging our feet. We are still debating, should I tithe from the gross or from the net? Really? Are we still talking about those things? I want to tell you what other people are doing. You go to waterfall in Midrand. The whole of Midrand, it is owned by Muslims. They understand their responsibility. They understand their mission. They understand their role. While we are still debating, should I tithe from the gross or from the net? Really? We're still debating that. Our boys are dying in big numbers, sleeping under the bridge. We are still debating. Can we tithe from crows or net? What's wrong with the body of Christ? What has gone wrong with the church of Jesus? We don't understand posterity. Thank you, sir, for having me. Because I understand that we are different in the body of Christ. You know, my boys in their schools, they are best runners now when it comes to 100 meters. I've got twins. Best runners for under 14. In a relay, they are also there together. But here is the secret of posterity. You need to understand that in a relay, there's only one person who goes down with his knee. He's paying the price for the rest of the team. He is leveling the ground. He is setting the pace for the rest of the team. Most of the time, they will choose a short guy on the starting line so that when he starts on the starting line, you don't delay, you don't need a tall guy on the starting line because a tall guy is trying to stand up. He's wasting some time. So we need a short guy who will pay the price and then who will take off. And you know what he does? He takes the baton. He gives it to a second person. The second person does not have to start on their knees because already somebody has started, has paid the price on their knees. They take it to the third person. The third person keeps on running. You know, they give it to the finisher. And the finisher will finish. Have you seen Usain Bolt? Have you seen Usain Bolt? Everybody, they come, they celebrate Usain Bolt. They forget the starter. They forget the second one. Listen to me, I don't care who gets the credit at the end of the day. All that I know, I had to set the pace. All that I know, I had to pay the price. Even if I'm not celebrated, say, it is not about me. It's about the next generation. It's about my children. It's about the future.
Men of God, women of God, understand that you may not be celebrated. It is okay. Keep on setting the pace. Keep on paying the price. I started a ministry in our house. We moved to the tent. Please be seated. I'm about to close. Be seated. I started a ministry in the tent. In my house, we moved into the tent for, for six years. But I made a vow to God. I said, every young minister that I'm going to plant, they're not going to start in the tent. Here's one of them. It did, not, it did not start in the tent. Especially African people, we need to get rid of this mentality that says, I have suffered. They must also suffer. That is not of God. That is not a spirit of a father. A real father. You want to see your children going further. I think that is what the scripture says. It says children, they are like an arrow in the hand of a warrior. My role as a warrior is to sharpen the arrow, is to straighten the arrow, is to channel the arrow, is to release the arrow as far as it can go. I say to my sons, I am releasing you from here as a warrior in my hands. But I want you to go far because these are the matters of posterity. You don't shoot arrows to be where you are. This is what we do as pastors. Boop. I'm almost done. Now the question is, how do I reclaim my identity? Now I know what is my identity, but how do I reclaim that? I'm glad you have asked it. Number one, find your place in Christ, not in men, not in other people. Find your place in Christ. Verse 6 of Ephesians it says, For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realm. Find your place in Christ. You know, some of you are not attractive. Because you are in a wrong place. You know, this is a can of Coke. You can go to pick and pay. You can get this for five, five hundred and fifty. If you go to a spa, probably they will be cheap. It will be five rent a can. Because it depends where is this can positioned. Recently, I went to the palace in Sun City, five star. The very same can. That cost me five friends. Now, because I'm somewhere in Santi, I am paying 40 rand for it. It depends where you are. The other time I went to Dubai, in one of the five stars in Dubai, I paid 80 rand for this can of Coke. My spirit said to me, in South Africa, pick and pay. I can buy this for five rand. They said to me, sir, you are not just buying a can here. We have built this city from nothing. We only had the desert and the water. That is why you are here to experience what we have done. We have taken this coke from spa and then we have positioned this coke right here. It's not about the coke, it's about the position. 
am I speaking something to somebody? I'm saying to you, you know why they don't value you? It's because you have positioned yourself wrongly. You know why they don't honor you? It is because you have positioned yourself wrongly. It is time, body of Christ, to position ourselves, you know, to Christ Jesus. Take your position of authority. This is where you belong. The government and some leaders, they are treating us as if we are from pick and pay. Because this is how we presented ourselves. When the mayor or the premier visit your church, you even give them a moment to speak. You change your sermon because of a mayor or a premier who visited your church. I don't do that. I will recognize them while seated. You did not tell me that you are coming. Oh, we've got the mayor today. Good to see you, Mr. Mayor. Good to see you, Mrs. Mayor. I am in charge here. Christ is on the throne here. It's not about the mayor. It's about him. It is time, Church of Jesus, to position ourselves. Let us get the presence of God back into the house of the Lord. Let us begin to walk in the presence of God. Let us begin to, to clothe ourselves with the presence of God. My Bible tells me that Moses will spend some hours and hours with God on the mountain. When he comes down, he will reflect the presence of God. Everybody will run away from him. Today, they don't respect us because they don't see the presence of God. They even treat us. Look at the COVID. They closed the churches, but everybody was operating. They should be in, they should be in the buses, the taxis. You know, everybody was operating. They know they cannot touch the taxi drivers. They know. They know. Because they are united. Come to the body of Christ. They say, Romans 30. Romans 30. And they also write on that. Romans 13. When we want to speak, they say, hey, Romans 13. Obey us. Romans 13. How do you obey a cook? Church, position yourself. Position yourself. It's time. Number two. Know what you possess through Christ Jesus. Know what you possess. Let me tell you. 80 rand in Dubai. I drank still water. Mineral water. Did not quench my thirst. Something in my body <laughs> needed this stuff. And I'm told this stuff is not healthy. But something in my body needed this Coke far away. At home is 50 rand. But here is 80 rand. You know why? It was about the container. The content, I mean. It was about the content. What was in the inside that made me to part with my intellect. I'm saying to you, know what you possess. The Bible says, God has put all things under the authority of Christ and he has made him head over all things. It goes on, it says, for the benefit of the church. This world will never benefit without you. You are here for a reason, men of God. There are many people who are still alive in this community 
because of this church. The prayers of this church preserve this community. And finally, you need to take dominion. Take dominion. Taking dominion simply means the rightful, take your rightful position. Exercise your power to command and expect a fulfillment of that appeal. Command. To dominate simply means to occupy and to govern your God-given territory. We are called to govern, to make disciples of all nations. What is a nation? It's a topic for another day. But let me close with this verse, which is still troubling me when it comes to your body of Christ. Listen to this verse. Psalms 115, verse 15. It says, may you be blessed by the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. It goes on, it says, the highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to who? To me. He says, the heaven, the highest heaven, it's mine. I have given you the earth. It's yours. But you know what we have done, Apostle? We are saying, Lord, we don't want this earth. We want your heaven. We sing song, I'll fly away, oh Lord. No flying, no flying. No flying. Wait with flying. Where? Flying where? Who? Who's heaven? He says, it's my heaven. I have given you the earth to take charge of it. You are saying, I'm not going to take care of this earth. I'm going to neglect this earth. I'm going to allow the crooks. I'm going to allow, you know, evil politicians to take over this earth. I am waiting. I am waiting for the new heaven, for the new heaven. We used to sing a song in our church. We say, even if I, I have dirty clothes, I don't care. I know I've got new clothes on the other side, you know, of the river. Hey, hey, hey. I need new clothes right here. I need new car right here. I need a beautiful house right here. I need a beautiful garden right here. The Lord says, I have given you the earth. And know what we have done? We have given the earth to the politicians. We say to the unbelievers, we say, rule our educational system. They've messed up our medica educational system. Now our children, they must pass with the only 30%, you know, pass rate. That is how they've lowered the education of our, of our children. You go to the public hospitals, they've messed them out. You know, everything is not functioning. Look at the railway. Look at the railway that we took over, the infrastructure that was so excellent in 1994. Today, there are no trains. You know, the people, they still and even still, they still. And pastors in the church, they are saying, fear not, children of the Most High God. We can suffer here on earth, hallelujah. We can suffer here on earth. But the Lord, the Lord has prepared a house for us on the other side. We can suffer here, but the Lord has prepared. You will suffer alone. I refuse to suffer. I refuse to suffer. Because I know my minded, I know my role, I know my responsibility. My responsibility is to sit here, is to take charge, is to dominate and take this nation to the other side. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. One day, we're going to give an account of this earth that what is it that we have done we have neglected this earth I'm closing with this statement from Mark Zigerberg he says whatever you do don't discount yourself 
I am S.C. Matibula. And Jesus is my Lord. God bless you.